May 31st, 1927. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Oh yeah, we were, we were living in Vega Street, and uh, my sister and I saw a movie together. We, we were kind of together, we were just a year apart. Ronald Reagan was a war hero, and he was shot down, and, and uh, my sister was kind of crying on the way back home because she kind of liked Reagan. <laughs> and, uh, and so we come home, and my, my dad says, there's war. War started. And that was the first time I heard it. And so there's some things like that you never forget, I guess. Uh, what the Japanese did, uh, it, it, it kind of got me. It was, it was, uh, first of all, I was thinking of going in the Navy, but I was only about uh, 14, I guess. My dad worked at Art Metal, okay. like they say, a press operator. Okay. And uh, he got me in uh, uh, shortly, because at 17 I quit and I wanted to join the Navy. Well, they weren't going to sign. They had to sign a paper, I guess. And, and I was stubborn, and, and, and then he got me the job in art metal. Yeah. I only stayed about six months, and then at 17, I, I joined the Navy. And then after Samson, then where did you go? Uh, Treasure Island in um, California. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there about two two or three weeks before I got on the uh, Brookings. It was a um, APA troop transport, attack troop transport. And Treasure Island, that's near, Sa that's near San Francisco? Uh, yes, San yeah. Francisco. But uh, Shoemaker, Shoemaker was a town near <coughs> Oakland, just south of there. That was a Navy uh, b uh, station there. But when we go, when, before we went overseas, we went to Treasure Island. Do you remember going under the Golden Gate Bridge? <laughs> what was your experience when you saw, that was sort of the point where you either left or you came back? Right. Uh, what was uh, your experience? How'd you feel? Oh, that excitement a little bit. Uh, and, and I was leaving the, the country. And, but it was mostly... It, was, it wasn't fear. I mean, I figured this is what I should do. Uh, uh, at that time, too, you realize the war was going on for about two and a half or three years. And uh, um, seeing all those young guys going in, I had to get in. I was kind of disappointed. Uh, I wouldn't dare say that to the old salts about, oh, gee, I was in no battle or something like that. But. Uh, that's all I could say. I, I joined the Navy at 17 and went overseas, and we were in Anahuitoc. That's in the center of the, and uh, that's when I was 18. I shouldn't say this, but I was surprised. Over the loudspeaker, they said Jamestown, New York had a tornado in Brooklyn Square. Wow. And uh, gosh, I, I thought of that. Uh, I, I start writing to uh, uh, the parents, but this was email, or not e Well, we called it email, I think. Uh, it would, uh, we, we had to type it out, or they, they typed it for us. V-mail, I think it was called V-mail at that time. They found out I was slightly colorblind and uh, but they knew I had I put down on my original papers that I was interested in mecha mechanical work and in machine shops and so forth. So when I did go to land, they put me with um, what was um, cargo transportation office, but but I was working uh, on the um, engines at that time. Uh, I was uh, running this grinder to. To, to grind the tappets and uh, into the cylinders so they set well. And I, actually, that was the first time I, I ran that type of machine. I was mostly familiar with high school lathe and so forth. I was assigned to the 7th Fleet before I even got there. 
And, and, and I, of course, I thought I was going to go on some warship because I, I, I used to build model, air, uh, model ships. I used to enjoy that. But anyways, uh, I saw the 5th Fleet there in uh, Leyte Gulf with the 7th Fleet that I was supposed <coughs> to be part of. And it was th thrilling to see those warships that I made some of the models of. They were, they were all going north. Um, I wasn't in any battle, but I did go overseas during the, the war time, and oh, the closest thing was the Indianapolis was sunk, and we were the first, well, to hear about it. Our, the, the ship that I, uh, not the ship I was on, but uh, the, um, the other ships in that area brought them over to, um, let's see, Samar. Well, I was at the um, Leyte Gulf at that time. Well, it is the greatest story never told. On July 30th, 1945, in the final days of World War II, the USS Indianapolis was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. She sank in 12 minutes here in the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean, somewhere between Guam and the Philippines. 1,200 sailors went into shark-infested waters. Almost five days later, only 300 made it out alive. It was the greatest disaster in the history of the United States Navy and the worst shark attack of all time. Cruiser had just delivered components for the atomic bomb. Later would be dropped on Hiroshima. They were headed home when it was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. Of the nearly 1,200 on board, 300 were killed instantly. 900 survived. Five days later, when rescued, just 320 were still living. More killed by sharks and dehydration than the Japanese. The, we had the, probably the nearest, largest uh, tent-type hospital about two and a half miles where I was and our trucks were used to bring in medication and so forth for these guys. Uh, some of them went back to Guam because uh, the um, Indianapolis left Guam to head for the Seventh Fleet, I, or for their Fifth Fleet. And uh, I wondered why, I mean, after I came home and I realized what was happening, you hear more about the, uh, the history of a war at home than you do it there. But uh, I realized what was happening. The, the cruiser was going back to join the Fifth Fleet that was going up to uh, Okinawa at the time. Okinawa was still in battle. Manila was just north, uh, northwest of us. And, and the other one, the big island down there, uh, Mindanao, in the center was, they were still fighting. When you were out in the Pacific, uh, did you get much information about what was going on? <laughs> The impression was that it was still going to go, go on because there was no such thing as an atomic bomb. And the Japanese were still fighting hard in, in, in Okinawa when I was in the Philippines up north. And uh, then that big storm came and, and it, it hit us pretty bad and it, it hit um, uh, Okinawa. Uh, the, the fleet was out there when that happened. All this we hear from people, guys happened to know or be there. And we were in a position where there was a lot of ships coming in and out. <laughs> the, the monkeys. <laughs> oh, one, one Filipino used to bring, he used to come in, a very elderly man, and uh, he would walk around with his monkey, and that little monkey would jump on your, on your um, uh, shoulder there, and then his little figures would go into the <laughs> pocket to see, uh, you know, what it was. <laughs> the cutest little guy. Uh, they liked monkeys, but they didn't like dogs, the, the Filipinos, at least, that were in, in that area. I know I didn't like the guard duty. We all had to have guard duty. And that, <coughs> that was kind of rough a little bit, uh, dark, all alone <laughs> to, to guard the place. and. Uh, um, uh, that was probably the most hairy part because there were a few men that were killed and don't know what. I, they did say there were um, Japanese in Samar itself, but that island is so surrounded by like Leyte and, uh, and Mindanao that it was pretty safe. 
which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. We were all surprised that the war was over. Um, some of the ships were firing uh, anti-aircraft guns safely in the air. Um, we, we celebrated. I don't know if I celebrated, but I might have been a little disappointed in a way. That's one thing I have to be very careful. They would throw me all overboard if they caught. So if I said, "Well, gee, I, I didn't see any action," I, I got the um, the victory medal, of course, or if, uh, in the um, um, Philippine Liberation, in the Asiatic Pacific, and uh, one more was was the American Theater. Your son wants to know uh, why you did not get a Navy Good Conduct Medal. <laughs> I was out of uniform. I didn't have a hat on. I come up from the engine room. Very early when I went overseas, I got that. Well, you have to report to the uh, Master at Arms uh, once, probably twice a day. Just to, but I only had it for one day. You come home. You come home to Jamestown and you see, who you haven't seen in a while, your mom and dad for the first time. What was that like, the reunion? Well, I called from San Francisco when I got, when he got there. And I talked to my mother that I was coming home. And I, uh, I was carrying my sea bag. It was funny because we, we were supposed to go to a, a New York uh, to get discharged. So I was carrying my sea bag and the taxi driver stopped and, come on, I'll take you home. So uh, I thought that was nice. But anyhow, when I popped in, my, my, my mother took a bit, big breath because she knew what was coming, but I guess she, when the first time she saw me, then she kind of got excited. And my father, when he heard about it, he left the shop to come over. You were an important part of the whole machinery of the war. There was so much behind all that. But then you just cheered me up because that second part, being, being a, a machinist in Quonset Point, Rhode Island, oh, a beautiful title, uh, Fleet Service Squadron 101, oh boy. I was still land duty and it was and I didn't go overseas. I was down. But you said, yes, uh, with my f background and machinist, I went up fast. But that, the you know, most important thing was I was doing the things that were really important. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to make brackets for uh, the uh, sonar boy. Here are electronic devices of every type, searching out through the surrounding blackness of sky and water sounding beneath the ocean to trace the movements of every ship and plane in the task force and detect at a safe distance any unidentified units. In order for an airplane to find out if a submarine's in the water, radar doesn't mean a thing to them. You have to drop a sonar buoy that will float on the water. Underneath the sonar buoy will give signals that there's a submarine around. On the top of the sonar buoy, the, the plane would find out that it's there. So it's a unique thing. And it came out at that time and they wanted to make a bunch of brackets to hold this sonar boy when they threw him in the water. And that was my first job. <laughs>